Um, you spoke of um, speed. Well, first, I guess this one, this this one first. This one I had in my head for a while. The, the presentation that you have right now, are you going to be posting that on a blog or something? Because I'd like to reference it. Yeah. In fact, if you if you go to prezi.com, P-R-E-Z-I.com, and just search Intellex, it'll come up. And I'll put links up on the Startup Advantage. I'll, yeah, I'll put a link. Great. Just read it out <laughs> and uh, my second question is, you spoke of you were gonna, going to a speed dating kind of event in Toronto. Um, where can we get more resources um, on that as far as you know what, what cities usually host these kind of things and how can we exactly participate in these kind of speed dating events? Because I, I think it's particularly helpful for someone like me who, ha who is just starting out first startup kind of thing to get practice in that area as well as pitching as much as possible to many different kinds of investors as possible. Yeah, well, and, and um, amazingly enough, a lot of these events, this one notwithstanding, you can actually participate in via Ustream or, or one of the other streaming capabilities. So I'm amazed at how many conferences in our space take place now you don't actually have to attend to learn from. You don't have the benefit of the one-to-one the -one interaction. At least you can hear the, the, the questions and the conversations, and it does help. Um, you know the awesome eight folks here. You've got to find those those people in each of the cities that you decide you want to follow, because they're, they're there. Um, because I'm eventually moving back to Canada, and the founders of the company I'm, I'm uh, running are based in Toronto. I said to myself, I gotta get immersed back into the Canadian tech scene. So I just sort of sought out um, probably about a half a dozen people and started following them on Twitter and started communicating with them. I, you know, when I got a chance to go up there, I made sure I went and had coffee with them and I went to, you know, there's a there's a organization called Sprouter that has these events called Sprout Ups and, you know, and it's like startup drinks and all that kind of stuff. And you just go and hang with them. And every, almost every major city in the US has them. Certainly every major city with any kind of a technology footprint. And around conferences like at uh, South by Southwest the, earlier this year, uh, the Venture Hacks, Navi, what, Navi and what's the other guy's name? They, they had a, a meetup, so I went over to the hotel, shook his hand, introduced myself. And then, so they're, you know, they're all around if you just gotta, you know, kind of follow where they are. And South by Southwest in the, Austin, it's in, in April? It's in March. That's, that's sort of the mecca for this this group of, of Most people. Most of consumer-facing web stuff, that's the place to so one, a good place to be. Plan for it. it sells out quickly. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any problem raising funds from friends, so I already did that because the money was very kind. Uh, but the problem is now I need to go move on to the next level. Uh, well, I got approached by two individuals out of Virginia saying, we'll help you, we'll get you uh, set up uh, stock A, stock, stock options, all that kind of thing, which I have no clue what they're talking about. And they're saying, but we want 30% of your company. Beware. <laughs> oh. The investors want 30% no, 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 and then the guys no, that no, raised the money. are going to put it all together so that I can go and talk to run. them. Yeah, run. <laughs> no, that's, a lot of the, the, the sites that I'm talking about will talk about what, what, what makes sense in terms of what you should give up along the way. If somebody wants to raise money for you, first of all, they're going to suck you dry because it means they've got too much time on their hands. Um, but if you are prepared to, to allow them to do it, uh, make sure you, you don't sign any exclusivity and give them ability to um, you know, sort of hold you up. Okay? Um, people sometimes have contacts and they want to, in some cases, be rewarded for bringing real investors to the table. Uh, typical rewards for that kind of service um, are five to six percent, half of that in cash, proceeds being cash, half of it being in equity. That's just sort of rough. Could be a little higher, could be a little lower. But I would say, you know, budget on giving up 5%, 2, 2.5% in equity to 2.5% in proceeds. If they want more, 
then they better be writing their own checks. And you know, 30% isn't too much to give up in a, in a Series A round if it's significant, depending on how much you've raised with friends and family and, and what else they bring to the table. But the more you dilute yourself in an early round, the less you're going to have to play with in subsequent rounds. And if it's an astute investor, they may want some kind of provisions that protect them that if there are subsequent rounds, they don't actually get diluted. And that's part of those, that group of terms that I didn't talk about. Go to those websites that I mentioned the, under the docs and read them, and read them carefully. And they will, they'll talk about each and every um, term and provision on a term sheet. And some are acceptable, some are acceptable under certain circumstances, and some you probably just want to say um, no, and it's non-negotiable. I think uh, just networking what you're doing tonight, I mean listening, most of us are cheap dates, take people out to lunch, see some what their experiences are. You get friendly, friendly lawyers that will give you some advice without you know, saying they're going to write your term sheet for you, or give you some advice now and then when the time comes, employee to, to help write the church. But they need to understand um, startup investment too. You, know, you don't want to hire a corporate lawyer or an IP lawyer to be doing those things. Don't let them put money in your company either because they'll take it over. It'll be gone. We're going to be going on smart money versus dumb money. <laughs> I'm not sure where the lawyers fit. Other questions? Okay. All right, so I've got, say, theoretical consumer internet startup. Um, Four square or something like that. I raise million, million five for the seed round. What do I spend that on? Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> well I, you know, if if you if you had just exited a company, you know, with a five billion dollar market cap, first of all, I'd be asking why aren't you writing your own checks? But these guys, the interesting thing is, some of these serial entrepreneurs that have done really, really well, also have no problems looking to spend other people's money instead of their own. Which to me as an investor would always be a question I'd ask. But nonetheless, sometimes they'll say, you know, we want to bring other uh, other people to the table and I do my own other investing and we want to share the wealth, whatever it is. Um, I'd want to know what you're going to spend a million and a half dollars. Um, for us, for ours, um, to actually build out all the technology side of our business, it's not going to take a quarter of a million which you know, amazes people because I got a hockey stick projection that could show us going to 30 to 50 million dollars in three years without much difficulty. But what we have spent money on in our business is getting inside the old boys network of the golf industry, which means spending time at the PGA of America or the USGA. Man, you've got and the best job in the world. You get to <laughs> <laughs> you gotta work the room. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you're sponsoring things at Augusta or whatever it is. There, there are some places where you do have to spend an awful lot of money, um, but be careful. They're gonna. If I was an investor again, I'd look at what are you going to spend the money on, and is it absolutely necessary? You know, we're going to sell something to uh, doctors. Well, you probably need to hire someone that's in the medical sales business now. What do you budget for a medical sales person? They make pretty good money. You better count on yeah. 150 base. As soon as you start hiring people, you can start spending money quickly. 150 commission at, you know, hitting their numbers, maybe more. And you gotta pay them for six months before they get to be productive. So once you start doing those kinds of things, the money can go fairly quickly once you just have to stop up. Yeah, I think that, uh, that in puts more emphasis back on the timing of when's the right time to raise the money because that money brings the pressure to spend it. They don't want to put, they don't want to write a million half dollar check and it goes in a bank and just sits there and you're pulling off 20,000 a month. They want to know that, hey, this is going to go to work over the next 12 to 18 months and here's the burn rate that it's going to go through, which means there's pressure to hire, there's pressure and you better be ready at that phase or it's not the right time to take the money. Customer acquisition. How are you going to get your customers? Are you just going to find find yet? You know. So again, in our business, um, we're looking for golfers. Well, we're going to try to use LinkedIn, all the free ways, and, and you know, get a good blog going, and you know, 
stoke the viral engine, but you know what? They also watch the Golf Channel and they also read Golf Digest. Those are not inexpensive vehicles for reach. So, you know, the questions they're going to ask, they're not, they're not going to say how much is an ad in Golf Digest. What they're going to ask me is, what's the reach? What's the conversion? What's the, that, then the total cost of conversion? And then what's your revenue per converted you know, sign-up? So we think in the first year we'll generate anywhere from $10 to $15 per member of the Players Golf Network. The thing it's going to cost us five bucks. But if we have to spend the five dollars up front before we get the, the 10 or 15, we got to have that money. So you know, if we want to have 100,000 members by this time next year, we got to spend $500,000 in traditional media reach to get to or if, if half of it's going to come from you, we have to spend 250 million. So it's, it's interesting. Often the investment isn't necessarily to build the product, it's to take it to market. Building the product is actually the table stakes to earn the right to ask for the money. Other questions? Okay. I just had a comment. I think all you get is money from investors, you, you didn't get a very good deal. But it's important that you get some expertise and get people that are able to help you and are willing to help you along with the money. I agree with that. Ten times. an advisory board. So the only, the only caveat I would say to that is if every investor requires that they come along with their investment. You may end up with a bigger management team or advisory board than you do customer base or... I don't think that's what it meant though. I mean, what we were looking for from our investors was open a door for us. You have all these doors and yet they refuse to open them for us. That's they, what we're looking for. We did, they were hands off. They, they didn't know anything about the business. Why do you think that is? <laughs> because they were idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Asking about the IQ. <laughs> well, and maybe that goes back to, to doing your homework to make sure that they are seasoned investors and what they brought to the table in the past yeah. is of value to their investors. I think that was, that was it right there. Is don't take but I will tell you, money. there's a lot of people with a lot of money whose reputation in the, in the business community may be more important to them than the money that the check that they wrote. So it may be also that you're at a stage where they're prepared to take a flyer on an idea, but they're not prepared to put their reputation at stake and open a door for you <coughs> until you've proven yourself or gotten some, some traction. And I'll give you a great example. We, we were fortunate enough to have a guy named Chris Simon, who's the EVP of Sales and Marketing for CBS Television on our board of directors. He's the number two guy. And Les Munez, whatever his name is. Moonbiz. Yeah. Moonbiz. He's the number two guy. Nobody hired. I talk to him once every six, eight weeks. I have yet to ask a favor of him. Because when you do, it's got to be the right one. And it's got to be the right time. He's, off, he's offered open doors. But we're not ready. And the last thing I want to do is build, do some boneheaded thing that doesn't reflect well on But you know, once once you're ready, to me that's that is the good test of an investor is what else are you gonna to bring to the table and how are you gonna help us succeed? And it's in their best interest. Yeah. Okay. But I would say also you can't, you know, I, I, I took a company public and had I don't know how many shareholders. You at some point you can't get the job done if you have to be a servant to all of your shareholders. So one of the ways to do that is find the people that you do know and trust, create an advisory board. Um, and also, um, it doesn't mean to say everybody has to be on your advisory board, but let people know from time to time you'd like to contact them and, and ask them for a favor. You can also honest. get an advisory board put together of people who aren't investors, just people who want to be you know, yeah, supported by people. And that's just good business. Yeah. Well, thanks, Paul. There.